Let us know when you're willing, Alan. We are indeed. Okay. Alan, you want to give us your uh, full name and spell it for us, please? Alan Doxtator. That's A L L E N D O X T A T O R. Do you have a middle name? Paul. I was after my grandpa. And uh, what's your date of birth? Excuse me, my mother's grandpa. Not mine. My grandpa was Chansey and Isaac. My date of birth is uh, September 18, 1940. And where were you born? Right where the duck pond is by the new, by the uh, Radisson and the casino there. Right where that, the east edge of that duck pond was, our, was where our house was located. And uh, give me the names of your parents, with your mother's maiden name. Uh, my mother's maiden name was Doxeter also, Melinda Doxeter. My dad was uh, Clifford Doxeter. And uh, do you remember your grandparents? Uh, Isaac and Chansey were my, uh, Chansey was my maternal grandfather uh, and uh, Isaac was my dad's. My grandmothers I never knew, I don't remember ever seeing them. What do you remember about your grandparents? Uh, well, they seemed to have fun when they were just family, you know. All the family get together and they would have fun and jig a little bit. And <laughs> well, where, where did they res uh, reside? Um, but when I knew Chansey, he resided right over there by, uh, across from Percy's, but along the railroad tracks in that little house there. And uh, my grand Father Isaac, uh, he was kind of a wanderer. He didn't have any occupation, and he came and went as he pleased. I don't know if he had a home. My knowledge, I think he died when I was about six. I see. And Chansey died not too much longer. I think I was ten when Chansey died. Uh, did you have much time to uh, opportunity to spend with them? Chansey, yes. Not not much Isaac, Grandpa Isaac, Grandpa Ike, because uh, he was. Here and there, he worked all over, probably all over the United States, and he was never around. You don't know what kind of occupation he was, he was in? Logging mostly, you know, because that's all the Indians did then. The older Indians, they, um, principally they would go up north during the wintertime to the Menominee Reservation and uh, log all winter, come back home do a little gardening and that's about it. Maybe farm work in the summer, but if the farmers needed help, that's all I can remember them doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about your dad. Uh, did he ever tell you what kind of education background he had? He went to the fifth grade. Uh, he could read and write, read a newspaper, but other than that, he didn't have much education. And what, what, what was his background? Uh, they were, all of them were born over <coughs> in and around where the uh, a new casino is now, and that was all Doxley, the property, and it was your, because we're related to your grandma, my, my dad was your, your grandma's first cousin, Grandma Blanche, mm -hmm. and so they were all, had sections next to each other there. And what kind of work did he do? Construction, he worked construction all his life. It was, it was pretty hard for him because he never, in those days, he didn't get unemployment. So in the wintertime, it was sometimes tough sledding, they say. We don't remember we were kids, you know. Just as happy as pigs in the mud. We didn't, we didn't know we were poor. Now, did your dad have any uh, uh, outside activities he'd done besides work? He uh, started a baseball team, him and Norrin John. They had that where the diamond is behind the... Episcopal Church, you know, they, that was a field, and they, my dad and my older brothers, and Norn, and uh, Norn's brother, or Lawrence, I believe it was, all pitched in and graded that and filled it in and made a baseball diamond out of that. Well, what, what time frame would you think that would have been? 1945, 46. I see. And that took up a lot of his time then? Uh, all, all summer because he managed, he coached, he tr practiced, and they, they had practice two or three times a week. 
Saturday at practice. But uh, they had pretty, some pretty good baseball teams for the area. They had a couple of people go to the major leagues. A couple of people had an opportunity to go but backed out because they were, I don't know, timid, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, did your, your father speak to Oneida? No, he didn't. My, uh, his mother left home when she was three and never returned until she was 19. And so she didn't speak at all. And uh, consequently, he didn't speak. My mother spoke, but uh, in the house, because he couldn't understand, we didn't get a lot of uh, Indian Oneida either. So that's pretty, uh, the words we know are, you know, most everybody knows. What about your mother? What was her background in terms of education? I think she went through the eighth grade. She and uh, close to that anyway. I'm not really sure, but I think she went through the eighth grade because she she seemed to be more educated than dad. She knew how to read and write better. Now, did your your dad? Uh, how many brothers and sisters did he have? Well, we had I had six sisters and four brothers, really uh, seven sisters, but one passed away. The first one was in uh, probably 1925 or so. Do you, do you remember their names? All my sisters and brothers, yeah. Clifford is living yet. Donald, he's passed away. Roman. Uh, then below me is Vic. My oldest sister is Clarissa, and then Marilyn, Rachel, Ruthann, Gloria, and Pat. And those Don is the only one that's passed away in that family, mm -hmm. that part. Now, um, you were saying that <clears throat> when your mother and dad, when you were born, you were over, born over by the casino area. Yeah. Um, and you didn't have any le electricity or running water? No, we never. We didn't have any electricity or water until I was 12. <laughs> How far did you have to go to get it? When we lived by the airport, um, I think it was about a mile and a half, and after we moved from by there, by the airport casino there, we moved over on County Trunk U, uh, south, and they had water, water there, and then we moved on County Line Road, U, past where your, your mom and dad live, and there was nothing there, just, we had to haul water about three quarters of a mile. And we always had cattle, so we always had a big job of getting water. Now, I've heard stories, and maybe, I wonder if you heard this, anything like that, uh, uh, particularly the, your mother telling about the, uh, the move some of the family had to go through on the land by the airport. Yeah, she used to... Uh, share that with us? My mother used to, the only one, my dad never said anything about it, but um, when she was smaller, she was like eight years old, uh, everything was, it was, it was like 1915, 14, and uh, they, like I said, they used to go north for the winter and log, cut logs and wood, whatever they could do to earn money to eat, and when they came back home one day, they, uh, in the spring, their house was burned down and all everything that, all their belongings were sitting outside. So they had to move. The uh, tax assessor, I guess, said that they owed taxes on their land, which they, they didn't know about. And so they moved them off. And that was on the road behind where the casino is. There's a dead-end road goes back there. That's where... Um, my mother's mother used to live back there. So where those sludge ponds are? Yeah, just east of those, just right on, right at the gate where that dead end road goes to those sludge ponds. That's where Fort Howard mm -hmm. puts their right. waste in there. Mm -hmm. okay. But other than that, uh, that's the only time that she mentioned that they had any problems with the neighbors. The neighbors used to allow the boys, my older brothers, to work during the summer. Or they would pay them a little bit, and they would give us milk. 
and dairy products. And my brothers would work for um, these uh, for hogs. You know, what they would give us a hog or something, or two or three hogs, and then we'd bring them home and raise them up. Now, those hogs are about 400 pounds, and so tame you could we could ride on them. We used to ride around on the hogs. That was our activity. And then we we all cried when they uh, loaded them in a truck to butcher them. You know, <laughs> took them away. All the kids were out there crying. <laughs> that was about five then. Uh, you and your brothers and your dad, did uh, you do any hunting and fishing? Oh, uh, yeah, we used to hunt a lot. <clears throat> My dad used to go up north. <clears throat> it wasn't until 19, about 1934 he said that there was any deer around here. The first deer track he seen was in, uh, that used to be all swamp there where the uh, uh, IMAC Center is there, and in behind where the sludge ponds are in 1934, he said there was a deer track there, and because they used to go up north to the Menominee where they knew where the deer was, and there was a lot of prairie chicken. His dad used to uh, be an excellent shot, and he had to conserve his um, ammunition because they didn't they had to make their own, or they couldn't buy any because they were too poor. So he would use a 22 because that was the cheapest. And if he wanted, Dad said, if he wanted three partridge or two partridge, he would take three shells and make sh in case he missed one. And he'd come back with two partridge. And they used to do a lot of bear hunting with dogs, a lot of deer hunting. They'd, we did all our deer hunting up north near Wabino. There was more deer there. And they used to hunt with a group of um, people that used to live in a neighborhood, farmers, non-Indian farmers, and they would get 15, 20 deer every year, every fall. That would last us through the winter. Now I don't even like venison. And just 10, 15 years ago, I just didn't care for it anymore. Otherwise, I could eat it three times a day. What about fishing? We used to fish a lot with spears. In the, in the creeks, when there was creeks around. There was a little creek um, right along the airport road uh, between that tavern and the casino there. There used to be some, a lot of um, northern come up in there. We used to spear. And then Sucker would come up, Dutchman's Creek. And uh, east of the, or south of the airport, there's a little creek. We used to call it Little Creek. There used to be a lot of northern in Sakar out of there. Saltum. That would be good for winter time too. Well that was that was a way to support your family if you want to, I guess. Well your mother must have done a lot of canning then. Yeah, we had a garden. We had a work, like it or not, we had a hole. <laughs> Where did your uh, folks uh, go to church? Uh, not the church, the Episcopal church here. Um I probably all their life. I think that's the only one that uh, was, you know, handy for them or whatever, that they were instituted in that church. Give me a, a, a typical uh, Sunday at home when you were small. Get up in the morning, go to church. Sometimes we'd come home, and in the summertime we'd come home and have a quick lunch and then go to the ball game. And chase balls, chase foul balls, I would go into the weeds and and then uh, that would last like three, three hours, three and a half hours and we'd all, all, all the guys that chase fall balls would get a, bottle, a couple of bottles of pop at the end of the day, end of the game. That was about the extent of the pop we ever had, free for chasing balls. Pop was only a nickel or a dime, but we didn't have that much money to spend. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> my mom did of course, we'd beg and beg, and sometimes she'd break down because it was... It used to be hot in the summertime in those days. 90, 95, not like now. It barely gets to 90 now. Yeah. And then during the wintertime on Sunday, get up, get ready, go to church, come home. Well, if it was fall of the year, and we'd probably go hunting. It was wintertime, uh, hunting for pheasants or rabbits, 
something like that. In the winter time, then we, my dad would take us fox hunting. In the springtime, get up on Sunday morning, go to church. And we always went as a family, so the family was pretty close all the time, you know. You know that uh, if you go to church together, your family stays together. What did you use for hunting uh, when you did small game as opposed to uh, deer hunting? Or did you use the same kind of weapon? No. Uh, <clears throat> my dad used to work for, uh, and people would give him guns, so he had rifles. I still have one. It's like a 1919, 19, um, I, I think it's a 32 Remington pump. Uh, I don't think it's worth any money because it's, it's uh, pump is cracked, you know, the wood on there. But then we used to use shotguns. For rabbit hunting, we used 22. It's economical. But when I started to hunt, then we, all the older boys were working, so we always had enough money for shells. Uh, what, what about when you're hunting fox? 22, mostly. 22. Yeah. The, uh, the fox were um, too far away to hit, shoot with a shotgun, so we used a twenty-two. You couldn't use a rifle around here. Huh? Yeah, we sometimes we used a rifle because there wasn't over the, um, where we used on the Olsons and all that. It was Olsons farm was the only farm on that place, you know. And then between there and the county line road where you live, I think Sobek and Gizi and Moford were the only farms in that little area than Michaels and Rentmaster and uh, the uh, reformatory farm uh, they didn't they didn't care if you hunted down there as long as you didn't use a rifle and didn't get close too close to the buildings there yeah. okay. now when you when you're hunting a fox as opposed to deer is there, is there different ways that you hunt the uh, fox as opposed to hunting the deer uh, we used, my dad used to have dogs, he always just had some, what we, this is a little biased, but we always had the best hunting dogs, they would hunt rabbits, raccoon, mink, fox, coyote, and at that times he had bear dogs too. He always had about two dogs. Those were used for fox hunting and um, most generally he would <coughs> walk to the woods, well, most of the time we would walk, and well, as he got older, then we took cars, but we would always walk. We would walk four or five miles in one direction and hunt fox and then come home. And um, when he was a young man, him and my uncle George, the to George Duke, were hunt walked from by the airport there over to Olson's, uh, across country, that's probably five miles. And it, the dogs were chasing a coyote, and so they waited for until it got dark. And then my uncle George said, "Well, we better go home." And he said, "Yeah, we'll go. The dogs will come." So he, my dad, started out to go east, and Uncle George said, "You're going the wrong way." He said, "No, this is the way." He said, "No, you better go this way." My dad insisted, and they went east toward back home. My dad was real good in the woods. And pretty soon the moon came up at about 8 o'clock in the evening and uh, my Uncle George said, you know, that's the first time I've ever seen the moon come up in the west. <laughs> <laughs> and then he knew he was going the right direction. But uh, we used to mostly walk when, we, when I was little. When we'd go up north, we, uh, my dad would uh, set us on a deer run and he would roam the woods and there was a lot of deer then so I don't know I think there was more up there then than there is now way up by Wabino it's like around here now there's so many deer around here you seem to move south huh? yeah. yeah yeah where did you um well what about and what about your mother now uh she, you know she did was she a homemaker or did she work out no she didn't I don't think she worked out until all the kids were in school and then 
uh, you know, when, like when I was in high school. And I can't remember where she worked, but um, in her early years, she used to work downtown for, for restaurants and stuff like May Drury's. May Drury's was a restaurant that hired uh, what they would call bus boys now or whatever it was. And they used to get paid like 50 cents a day. And then they would take home leftovers. They could take home leftovers. She did it only a few years until she had children. Or, and then she never worked until, I think probably when I was like 16 or 18. And then, but she was always busy with the church functions and doing stuff for the church, sewing and making things and stuff like that. She also had another... Uh, group she was involved in that was the United Singers. Yeah. Do you remember? Can you remember back when she might have started, or did she always sing as long as you can remember? I don't know when she when she initially started, but uh, it was quite a few years ago. And then because for a long time they didn't have any uh, choir, Indian choir. When I was little, they didn't have an Indian choir uh, to sing Indian songs. I think that was probably because the uh, well, the federal government didn't want them even speaking Indian, and so they got away from that a little bit. But then later, as she, she grew older, I would say probably in her 50s or so, then she was involved in the Indian choir, and they used to go all over and sing. Did she ever mention to you the time she went to Germany? Yeah, she, just, she went over there. I can't remember how old she was. She was quite old then, but uh, she had a good time. She said it was something that she never expected to do, and she enjoyed herself. It was funny because she said, uh, she, said I, she went over to Germany, she came back, and she said, I ain't, I ain't leaving Oneida ever again, she said. He said, I'm not even going to go as far as freedom. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, here she's down in Milwaukee ready. Yeah, singing. Uh, uh, she was, uh, I think she'd go any place to sing because she liked to sing. Yeah, she loved to sing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where, did you, where did you start school? I started at the mission. We lived on County Trunk U, about a mile and a half. Yeah, about a mile and a little, maybe a mile and three quarters from the school. And we used to walk to the mission every day, and every day you get a licking from Father Christian. <laughs> no, he, he wasn't that bad. He was he was stern, but he was uh, did it for a reason. He had always had a good reason. He deserved it, huh? Yep. Okay. He didn't obey. Now, why, why'd you go to the mission? There was a school right up on the... Up on Double V and U uh, there, wasn't it? Oh, that, this is where we started. We lived south of uh, Oneida. Oh, okay. And then so we, we had a walk and oh, okay. to school. That was the closest. We could have went to the Catholic school, but my mother and dad were Episcopalian, so they wouldn't send us to the Catholic school. Okay. Or it was closer anyway. And it, you know, she was really involved in the church functions and things like that. So Were the sisters here then? Yeah, Sister Mabel, Mother Edith, uh, Sister Harriet. But how many how many kids were going to school at the time? There must have been sixty. Yeah. Sixty sixty kids. I think there was four four different classrooms. Twenty probably twenty kids in each class, you know, like first, second and third graders maybe were in one room and fourth and fifth or another and sixth, seventh and eighth or something like that. In two rooms. And that was at the Parish Hall? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, as you were growing up, did you um, did you work out in the summertime? You know, like uh, picking beans or... Oh, yeah. Uh, at home. We, we picked beans and cucumbers at home. And finally, when I got to be about 12 years old, uh, we picked for the, well, we always did pick for the neighbors. The neighbor, Alec Cornelius, always had beans. And we picked for him, and we picked our own, and uh, took them to the cannery at Seymour. 
that paid. I think I was 12 when we got, me and my brother Victor got our first bike, picked beans for about two weeks and got a bicycle. <laughs> couldn't ride it. We first one, huh? Yeah, couldn't ride it because we were, our backs were too sore. <laughs> Picking beans. No, that's just kidding. Well, what kind of work did you do? Did you go, did you go to work at uh, like lifting horseradish or uh, cherry picking or? Um, caddying at the golf course. Okay. I mean, that was a lot of money. We used to make five dollars a day over there. That was a lot of money for a kid. Never went to the horseradish farm. I uh, went cherry picking a couple of years. Uh, went with your your grandma and Lady Bennett, Lady and Bennett. to their camp. That was always fun. The only fun part was not get, getting up at 4 or 5 in the morning to go out there and pick cherries, and they'd make you go out there, too. <laughs> there were the good old days when somebody had control of the people. How did, um, what kind of other recreation activities were you involved in? I played ball, uh, baseball when I got to be about 16, 17. And I don't think I ever played for my dad's team. He went, he retired and uh, he had some, a bad experience. And quit base, playing baseball, uh, managing baseball. And I played baseball in high school. And after I got out of high school, I played this, you know, amateur baseball a couple times, but a couple years, but it was not a, I wasn't really interested in that. So, and then I went to, went to a vocational school this LG Augusta kind of twisted my arm and made me sign a go to a vocational school with him. So, and we used to play basketball down there. Beat some of some of the better boys down there. Where did you uh, where'd you go to school after you left the mission? I uh, went to Illinois, way up on five miles north of Oneida. When I graduated from that one room school, all eight, eight grades in one room. I graduated in 1953. Yeah. And then where'd you go? Seymour. We went downtown Seymour. Seymour had an old brick building. I think it was a three-story building they had school in. And about six weeks or eight weeks after we, when I was a freshman there, and we, they told us one morning, uh, Get all your books out of your locker and carry them up to the new school. And that was like a mile away. We had to walk all the way up there with our books. We didn't care. We were kids, you know. It was more fun walking. And, and But then they had, they had a new school. It was a high nice school. And graduated from there in 1957. How was that tr transition from, you know, a rural uh, one-room school to uh, going into the high school? Was that a big transition for you? Yeah, it was because... Uh, well, I, have, I had a pretty sheltered life until then. My mother, you know, we were always home, always with the family, and always working around the house, gardening or something, cutting wood for the, because we burned wood, we didn't have any gas or fuel, oil fuel. So we had to cut wood all winter. And so we never got out into the community very much. And when I went, when I went to high school, it was a big change. I didn't want to go to school. I was uh, fortunate that my mother made me go to school because I would have quit school when I was a freshman if I had my way. Overall, then, how was the, uh, would you say the experience was for high school? The end result was okay. Uh, we had a, quite a few hard times in high school with the uh, non-Indian children, you know, they, they were more than us and stuff. But uh, other than that, it was I got to meet a lot of Oneida people that I didn't know, didn't even know lived in Oneida. Because we, we had, like I say, we had a sheltered life. We stayed home, except for going to church. And there was like four churches in Oneida at the time, so most of the when I had people went to church, but they went to different ones. So we never met them. It was... It was
It turned out to be fun when I got to be a mm -hmm. senior. Were you involved in any uh, extracurricular activities besides baseball? No. Mm -hmm. I tried, but I was too small. I think I was, uh, I only weighed about 120 pounds when I was a senior. I didn't start, I didn't quit growing until I was about 19 years old. I graduated from high school when I was 17. What did you do after uh, high school? I went to vocational school a couple of years, auto mechanic. I thought I would like that, it was interesting. Well, before I went to vocational school, my dad got me a job with a, a welder in De Pere. It was a friend of his. His name was George Tyrion. He used to hunt with him. And uh, it was manual labor. And I, I got paid five dollars a week for eight hours a day. So I thought, well, I can do something more than this. So I went back to caddying at the golf course and then pretty soon I went to a vocational school. Learned the auto mechanic trade. And I did auto mechanic work until maybe fifteen years ago and I decided it was too greasy and dirty, I didn't want to do that anymore. But I enjoyed it. And that's that's and I went into service when I was 21 for four years. What'd you go into? Air Force. I was didn't want to go into Army or Marines because I didn't want to work that hard. I thought they were marching and stuff. I didn't really care for that. I thought maybe when I if I went into the Air Force, I'd be able to fly. But I, you got to be a college graduate to fly. So I worked on a jet engines mechanic. Where, where'd they send you for training? Uh, so, San, San Antonio, Texas, for basic training, and then from from there I went to um, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I stayed there the rest of my four years. I think I was at in Texas for four months, and then three years and six months in Florida. Oh. So you got to see quite a bit of Florida then. Huh? Well, not really. Just be in a hundred mile. Up and down the coast there, that's as far as we could go. Didn't have no car or anything. So, but it was nice. It was. It's too hot in the summer there. Yeah. It, on a, we worked on a flight line and it would be 110 degrees on a flight line. And during the Cuban crisis, we had to be out there 12 hours a day. And it was always they always put me on day shift. They wouldn't put me on night shift. So and. Uh, it was really hot in the summertime. I wouldn't recommend anybody move there for <laughs> summertime. Wintertime was nice. Have you finished your tour in uh, in the Air Force? What you do then? First thing I did was get mad at my brother, my brother Clifford, because he I was home one week and he had a job waiting for me, <laughs> and I wanted to draw unemployment for six months. But he had a job, worked on a railroad, working on a railroad. So I started out on the um, Milwaukee Road in Green Bay. And then I, I transferred to the Milwaukee Road in Milwaukee. And, well, I didn't care for the city of Milwaukee too much. So then I moved, I got a job with the Green, Green Bay. Well, I got a job back with the Milwaukee Road in, Ma in Green Bay and worked part-time on the Green Bay and Western until they were so desperate for people there that they finally hired me. Uh, one of the bigger stockholders was an engineer and he pushed them to hire me because I, he said I was a good worker. I guess that was kind of what I liked to do, was switching boxcars. It takes a little thinking to line up the cars right, you know, you get you have to make up a 120 car train and you have 15 stops to the end of your route and you got to line them up so the car so that they, the one next to the caboose isn't the first stop. <laughs> yeah. So it was fun. I like that. And I worked for 22 years and railroad was trying to get rid of men so they asked me if I wanted to take my retirement. So I did. And I, that was in 1960. 1986. Did you start a family during this time? Yeah, we had, uh, I got married in 1965. 
And what was your wife's name? Mary. Mary Jane. Her, her family name was Green. And any children? She had one, and then we had uh, three girls. To adopt. And what's her names? Dan was the oldest, her, her oldest, and uh, then we had uh, Angela, Maria, and Michelle, or their twins. And grandchildren? Yeah, Dan has five, Maria has two, Michelle has two, three. Michelle has three, and Angel has one. Well, that's a handful. Just enough. Are you getting close to uh, great-grandchildren yet? No. Not yet, huh? The oldest uh, one is 20, 21. Well, it could be. But she's, she's not, she doesn't have any intention of getting married yet. Mm -hmm. Well, after they start coming, they come, <laughs> they come fast. <laughs> yeah. uh, where did you, where did you reside once you got married? Um, first we lived in Green Bay in a trailer, co trailer court. Then we moved out right by the entrance to the Brown County Golf Course in a trailer house. And then we got our own. My um, wife's mother gave her some property right where we live now. Uh, nobody else wanted the land, so uh, she gave it to her. And we put a house up there, a double wide trailer home. And then from there we bought our own property another two and a half acres from uh, Lawrence Benoit, who used to live right at the end of Stagger Lane, uh, right in Stagger Lane there, and he sold us two and a half acres, and then we bought an acre and a half from the Veneven Oven, so we ended up with about five and a half acres there, and we've been living there ever since. Mm -hmm. And did your wife, did she work out of the home? Not when the, well, she did, when the children were going to, um, when the twins were little, five and six years old and she only worked teaching the United language because she could speak pretty good. Her mom and dad both spoke Oneida. So she was pretty fluent in the United language and if she didn't know something she could walk next door to their house and find out and she studied a lot and she studied under Cliff Abbott so she knew how to uh, break down the language so she could write it and stuff like that. They, uh, the uh, Oneida language uh, directors said that she was the best instructor that they had at that time. And she was, uh, in her class, they never spoke anything but Oneida. They didn't say hello. They said sake or saguli or something like that. They never spoke. They Did any of her school grow off on you? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. How about the... Uh, too. I also, I went to uh, UWM for, I was going to get a degree in business, started out UWM, we lived there for a while when the children were grown. Went to UWGB, I think I had two semesters to graduate, but I really didn't, I still don't care for school, but she liked it, she likes school. Mm -hmm. She's lacking three credits for her bachelor's. Mm -hmm. She always wants to go back, but she wants me to go with her, so she probably won't graduate. <laughs> when did you leave the railroad then? 1986. 86? Yeah. All right. What did you get into then? Oh, uh, just fooling around, got into, we sold, uh, me and Mary, Mary Jane sold life insurance for a while. And it's hard for uh, people just don't want to per buy from from certain people. So it was really hard. We didn't make a lot of money. We made a little bit. And then we had other projects. Still working on a few of them. I used to do. Uh, <clears throat> I got involved in the. Uh, can't even think of the name of the doing elderly taxes, and I graduated into doing taxes for uh, a lot of the younger people, mainly just to help them, because the, the tax 
preparers downtown to charge an arm and a leg to do your taxes. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I can help them a little bit out all that cost. And so we, my nephew and I, he, my nephew was the uh, library director. Your sister got us involved in the duty. She got us involved in working for the um, Internal Revenue Service. I can't remember the what it's called, tax, doing taxes anyway. So we did. We worked for her a couple of years, and then did it for Brian for about four years, and then the uh, we didn't pass our test. We got lazy because we did all our work on a computer, so we never studied. But I know I'm pretty, pretty astute in all the tax laws. Do you have any other uh, hobbies that you're gardening you outside of that? Just working around the garden, stuff like that. So I do a lot of. You don't do any more hunting and fishing? No, I haven't hunted for since our son was about 15. I just no one does, everything. All the hunting places are gone. You can't hunt any place anymore. What about uh, tribal uh, affairs? Did you get involved at all with tribal affairs? I tried to bring some uh, small business. Uh, I was involved with a small business organization trying to get monies from different people for to, to start small business grants. And I got out of that. Too many people... Uh, want to do something and then they don't want to continue, you know. They start up and then they say, well, do something else. And so I, I let somebody else handle that. And I was so, so busy with my own stuff, you know. I was working with uh, Brian, my nephew down here at the library, and that was, that turned into a year-round affair rather than just January, February, March, and April. I was doing that all year round. Was people were delinquent in their taxes some six, seven years. And <clears throat> so I, I became quite knowledgeable in the taxes because I, I like to read. I read a lot. And so I could help our people quite a bit in that area. But, uh, the, uh, the tribe in, in their their growth now. You've seen, you've been, you know, here since mm -hmm. the beginning, or here beginning, and, and what you see now, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of changes that have come about. Yeah, everything's growing. It's, we're using our money the right way. Uh, yeah, give, give us a, some idea of what you, what you see and, and what you feel about that. Well, I see a uh, song building a lot of infrastructure, a lot of homes. I, I'm really proud of the people that uh, that started this gaming because that if we if we wouldn't have had gaming here we'd have been really we'd have been like the uh, uh, Bad River people and the uh, South Ridge. You know, they don't they're, they're pretty far down on the line as far as income and they don't have a lot, you know, pretty poor people. Even though they still, they have gaming and they're still pretty poor. Mm -hmm. And we would have been worse than that with gaming, without gaming. So I can see this gaming has really been a, an attribute to the you know, Indian people. And there's a lot of <clears throat> people that have education now because of the gaming. And it's, have you had um, uh, any uh, stories that you've heard about the uh, the fifty two cents? <clears throat> no, <clears throat> I never got my fifty two cents because my mom always kept it. <laughs> do you do you have any idea what what we received it for? Well, yeah, it was for um, our participation in the. Um, War of Independence in the land that they uh, was involved there. I've done a little reading in that area and uh, 
the United States promise an annuity because of the of the United's participation, the United Land Stockbridge, and uh, the losses that they took during the uh, War of Independence, the land that was taken from them uh, prior to and after, and just uh, the treaties. The treaties were signed. I think the only thing I know for certain about the the um, fifty-two cents was that. They signed treaties, and because of the uh, allegiance with the United States to the war, to the state's war, they awarded them that f uh, 52 cents and gave them other, built them grist mills and even blacksmiths and things like that. Okay. And then we got a big payoff. Instead of taking a 52 cents, they paid us off. For What's your, uh, what's your feeling about the per capita payment? I, I like it for me, but uh, I could do without it. You know, there, uh, it's, money is money. It's just mm -hmm. gone, you know. You have it one day and the next day it's gone. True. And that's the way it is with people, with our younger people, giving this money and then Oh, uh, two to three days later, three, four thousand dollars is gone. Yeah. They could do more. They could probably be, be better off putting some buildings up, homes. Now, what do you feel that uh, the, the tribe is uh, is moving, and uh, much of it, uh, you know. Uh, people feel it's in a positive nature, but what would you like to see them emphasize are going to in, in a greater greater depth in any particular area? I'd like to see them build some activities like water park, a golf course. Uh, if you go to any golf course, even some, there's one between just west of West De Pere there. I can't remember, it's called some kind of creek. It's just flat golf course and there's <coughs> people stand in line to it's like a restaurant people stand in line to go there and uh, so I think the tribe would be uh, would benefit greatly by just a golf course as far as funds they, it would pay for itself and bring money into the tribe and the water park you can see they have one down in the Tundra Water Park in Green Bay now that's that's going to re really be a big hit with people. And if we build one out here, something like Six Flags, the water park with all that and stuff, even in a three or four month period, I think we could really do well. Uh, I don't like to see industry, because, you know, like machine shops and foundries and stuff like that, or even computer places because there's so much competition. You gotta get something that people will flock to without having them flock ten or different ten or twelve different spots, you know. Something that there's not a lot of competition. What's your um, what what would you like to recommend to the youth that are coming up? As bad as I hate to stay at, stay in school. <laughs> school is about, you know, you meet people. You, meet, you, you can meet a lot of different people and learn a lot of things. And uh, right today, in today's uh, situation, you have to have some schooling, otherwise you can't get a good job. They don't want to be dealers all their life, you know. They want to be in management or something. The only time you can get in management is through school. And if they have the opportunity, they they should look for a business of their own. The tribe should should fund people to get into business of their own. And that if if the tribe expands into getting people into business, then we're gonna make an impact on the. Uh, 
government around us. We're going to be, we can be involved in the government around us. Right now, there's not a lot of people that are involved in local governments other than our own. If we could uh, get people, businessmen to become wealthy businessmen, then they would carry some weight in the community. Is there an area I forgot to, you want to elaborate on? No, I don't. I can't think of anything that... Okay. Gordy, one thing got skipped over when you were talking about his, uh, I think it was his dad's family or whatever. I think he misunderstood and told his siblings when you were asking about... Oh, my dad's family? Yeah. I don't know if you wanted to get that on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, your dad's brothers and sisters. Um, my dad had one brother. His name was Russell. And three sisters. They visit, they didn't visit very much. The sisters lived in Milwaukee in Chicago, but my uncle Russell, he used to live out here. He did live in, in uh, Milwaukee for quite a while, but he moved back here and he died back, you know, out here. And my aunt, uh, Ivy, my dad's sister, she used to let us, invite us to Milwaukee to stay with her for a week when we were 10, 12 years old. And that's the first time we ever seen a city, so we were kind of scared. And it's three sisters, their names? Um, Gladys, Ivy, and I can't think of the other one. We weren't really a family like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that was. Did you know their last names? Were they married? Yeah. Um, I know their names just as well. I don't know my okay. own one. I can't think right, of right. <laughs> What about on your mother's side? What, how many were in her family? That side of her family I know pretty well. Uh, Marina was the oldest. She married uh, Smith. And they had about six or seven children in the Smith family. And uh, Pauline, I think she had Three children. What was her maiden, uh, her married name? King. Well, Pauline King. King. Yeah. Uh, um, and Ly Priscilla Lyons. They didn't. She didn't have any children. Her husband was Rudy. Rudolph. Yeah, Rudolph. Right. He was Menominee. Uh, she. Uh, Kate. Kate was my dad's sister. Catherine. And. Uh, my mother had uh, Blanche uh, Escamilla was my mother's sister. Uh, Belle Williams, from the, you know the Williams that used to live up on Seminary Bridge. Road. Yeah. yeah, she married Lou. Lou. I mean, uh, not Louis. Lou is a library director. Um, Pete. Pete Williams. Uh, she's still alive. She lives in Detroit. Okay. She's she's the only one left, right? Yeah, the only sister left. Yeah. Pete, she had a brother, Pete. He passed away a long time ago. Rimpton was her brother. Mm -hmm. Pete and Rimpton were their brothers. And she had a sister, and I can't think of her name. Took me a while to think of Catherine, but I now uh, well, I can see her. I can picture her. She'll come back to you. Yeah. Let's. Uh, you got. You brought a couple of pictures. Oh yeah. We're gonna. Uh, they're gonna set that up, and so they can shoot it on the camera for you. Okay. Do you want me to just bounce the light and see if we can get rid of that reflection stuff? No, we don't have any problems. I don't think. There's a panel. A little bit maybe. Yeah, it's a little better. You can change it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's in the picture on the left? Why don't you describe that one? The big picture is my mother. I don't know what age she was when she, that she had that taken. I imagine it was her early teens. Um, and we, I never received that picture until after she had passed away. And I don't even remember who gave it to me. 
So that would have been about what year? Do you have any idea? She was in her teens? Maybe, uh, 1919. Okay. Good quality picture, too. Yeah. So uh -huh. <laughs> what a great picture. Look at how this comes up. <laughs> Your close-up looks great on TV. Yeah. And who's in the other photo? That's her favorite son. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I can I can say that now because she can't argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> and what year would that have been? Mm, this good. Oh, you was about <laughs> seventeen there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted well, to I'm, be. I'm, I suppose about nineteen fifty. Okay. Fifty around then. And how old are you in that photo? I don't know. I'm thinking I'm ten. Nine to ten, probably. I was gonna say yeah, yeah, twelve maybe, the most. Okay. Well, you can always tell by the teeth. Nine or ten. <laughs> okay. Nice, Amy.